So in this lecture, we will be addressing the concept of sampling, meaning to go from a continuous time signal to a discrete time signal, pick out certain values of a continuous time signal, or sample it. And from do these samples, the question is, can we reconstruct our continuous signal uh, with those limited number of samples? Um, and the, the, whole, uh, the, the whole objective is to reduce the number of values in a signal that we need to process, that we need to store, um, that we need to deal with from the transmitter to the receiver if you were talking about a communications uh, application. So a, a continuous time signal, X of T for example, has everything, right? All values of X need to be uh, Okay. All right. So uh, in, in a continuous time signal X of T, all values of the signal X of T uh, need to be um, represented. So it's a continuous time signal. But I may not be uh, interested in processing all those values. I may not be interested in uh, storing all those values uh, because many of them might be redundant. So to remove that redundancy, I sample the signal, meaning I pick out only the important values in the signal. And I have to do this sampling in a, in a, in a smart way. I need to do it in such a way that later on, if I need to reconstruct the signal back, I can do that with those limited number of samples. Uh, so in this block diagram, we have an analog transducer, say X of T, which is representing say a voice, right? So it could be coming from an analog transducer. The X of T signal is a continuous time signal. And uh, we sample it, say ideally. So ideal sampling is essentially multiplying the signal with an impulse train. And we have to pick out uh, a, a specific um, range of frequencies uh, called the sampling frequency that will allow our reconstruction to be okay. So omega s, which in this case is the uh, sampling frequency in radians per second, is 2 pi divided by t, where cap t is the sampling time or the uh, resolution in time. So let me highlight that indicates sampling time or resolution in time. So if cap T or caps, so you know, some, some people call that T sub S for sampling time. Either way, it is the resolution in, in time domain after we uh, sample it. Once we sample, x of t is going to become x sub p of t. We have sampled the signal and later on if we need to reconstruct it, then we uh, pass it through the uh, reconstruction filter. All right, let us do this again. Um, so where was I? All right. So after we sample the signal, we get X sub P of T. We may be uh, interested in reconstructing that signal X of T back. So we pass it through a reconstruction filter. 
the output of the reconstruction filter we are uh, indicating as x sub r of t. And if that equals x of t, the original signal, then we have sampled it appropriately and we have reconstructed it appropriately. So the, the basic problem is to first be able to represent x of t using unique, uni represent uniquely by a sequence of equally spaced samples. So we have one sampling time, cap t, we are picking out samples of x of t at t, 2t, 3t and so on, they are equally spaced. And the question is, can x of t be uniquely represented by those set of samples? And it is depending on some constraints and let's take a look at that. I, I find uh, uh, an example like this very helpful to get things started when we talk about sampling and reconstruction. And this is essentially, you know, addressing the concept of reconstruction here. So I will ask you guys that if suppose you were given these set of signals, these set of samples, and let us say that, you know, the sampling time is t, right? So let's say this is t, this is 2t, this is 3t, and this is 4t, and this is say 5t, right? And those values would be what? Those would be x of cap t, and that would be x of 2t, and x of 3t, and x of 4t, and x of 5t. So if that is the case, can you guys think of ways you um, may be able to reconstruct ideas for reconstruction. Anyone? How would you reconstruct from this set of sample digital to analog converter? So in a digital to analog converter, what are you essentially doing? Like so, the digital to analog converters can be based on several schemes what would you be, uh, which one you, would you pick? How would you reconstruct the signal? In other words, if this is a set of samples for some random signal, some arbitrary signal, how would you uh, get it back to the continuous signal? Somehow smoothing the signal between the sample points. So, okay, so let's, let's, let's talk about that. Capacitor smoothing to make out the, okay. So first of all, why are we trying to smooth things out? You guys are assuming that things look like this. What if they don't? What if they are looking like this? So, sure, smoothing things out, but in terms of like ideas to reconstruct in very layman term, trying to find the envelope if your sampling frequency is high enough. Um, well, here is what, where I was going with it. <laughs> the first idea and probably the, the, the most obvious way to reconstruct the signal could be to connect the dots together, right, linearly. So I would say, all right, fine, let's just connect them together. And that's, that's, my, uh, that's my signal. That's my continuous signal. So I would say connect, maybe connect with straight lines, connect and connect and connect and connect and that's it that's my um that's my signal that's my continuous signal that approach in black is called linear interpolation
because all we all we did was linearly interpolated some values of x between the samples so wherever we didn't have the values we linearly interpolated between them and it is also called in terms of filtering it is called the first order filter first order uh, first order hold first order because it's linear right so that's one scheme what is another idea for reconstruction let me draw that maybe in green so in green i will try to sample and hold so sander mentioned something about digital to analog converter some of the digital to analog converters depend on sample and hold they hold the value until they get the next sample so that could look like this hold the value until you get the next one uh, maybe make it thicker hold the value until you get the next one hold the value until you get the next one hold the value until you get the next one hold the value until you get the next one and done right so this is another approximation that you might get this is a, 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 a probably a, a, a a poor approximation but it is a scheme nonetheless so that is in green i will say that's called zero order hold filter or zero hold filter and that generates a staircase waveform Now, apart from these two, there are many other more interesting ways to reconstruct and they go back to your comment, the first comment, smoothing the signal, right? So the, the chances of real signals are always smooth, right? The real, real signals are, uh, are not rectangles and linear in nature. Real signals are smooth. So we need to bring some sort of smoothness aspect to these uh, to these lines, to this, to this reconstruction idea. And the way we do that is to superimpose a sink onto each sample, meaning multiply each sample with a sink and then add all the sink functions up. So maybe I use blue for this. So for sink, I would say it goes to zero here. Uh, no. And then I would have a sink there, right? Like that. And then there would be another sink right here in blue. And so on. So I'm essentially taking x of t, x of 2t, x of 3t, and I'm multiplying each of those sample values with a sync function, right? With a sync function. But the sync is centered at uh, 0, t, 2t, 3t, and so on. So once I multiply that sample value with a sync function, its, its amplitude gets scaled. It might be positive, it might be negative, but whatever, it gets scaled. And then when I add up all those sinks, I will essentially get a smooth looking waveform, right? So that smoothness, the smoothing aspect is brought into this conversation because of the smoothness of the sink function. So that is called sink interpolation. So in blue, I have sink interpolation. Uh, and it's also called ideal reconstruction. 
that's one of the very, very good ways of reconstructing a signal. Um, is that the same as convolving the impulse train with a sync function? Yes, it is exactly the same as convolving with a sync function, yes. So we have looked at in this in, in this slide, we have taken a look at three things, right? Given a set of samples, can you do a sample and hold? Hold the value of the sample until you get the next one, right? <laughs> this time the convolution is going to be with impulses. So uh, convolution is, <laughs> is going to be simpler now. Um, so the first scheme that we looked at was just connect the dots, right? Connect the dots linearly. Linear interpolation, also called as the first order filter, first order hold. Um, the next scheme was the staircase waveform, called the zero order hold filter, which means I will hold the sample value until I get the next one. The next one, the third one in blue was the sync interpolation, the best one out of the three. It's ideal, inter uh, it's called the ideal reconstruction because it brings in all those smoothness aspects. And also, if you guys notice one uh, very interesting thing that um, happened while I was sketching the sync, you notice what I did? What is the contribution of the right sync to the left sample. What is the contribution of the right sync to the left sample? Absolutely zero. And the right, the same sync contributes zero here, zero here, zero here. So there is no interference between those sinks. So the zero crossings of the sink are in such a way that there is no interference between one sample to the next while you do the reconstruction. In other words, all the sync functions are orthogonal to each other. All right, so, well, it, it, today's lecture can be, you know, more or less summarized uh, by that discussion. Now let us talk about something else. And that has to do with, uh, Sampling. This was in context of reconstruction. Let us talk about sampling. Uh, let's see. All right, I can I can get rid of all these guys. So the next question is, if these are the samples, which does the frequency matter? Uh, period, the period of the sync must be 2t then. No, 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 the period is still t, right? Because you see, if this sync function is at 2t, this sync function is at t, this sync function is at 3t and so on. So the, the times at which the sinks happen are t, 2t, 3t, and so on. The width of each, the width of the main lobe is 2t, yes. All right, so the, the next question that I would like to talk about is, does the frequency matter? And to, to talk about that, let me draw two signals here. One is maybe how you would envision it, right? Maybe this is how you envision this. Maybe. Right? Or even this could happen. That could happen as well. I whenever I, uh, I when I sample this, I get those same samples. So the question is, will I will with those set of samples will I be able to regenerate the blue curve? 
And the answer is no, right? I will not be able to regenerate the blue curve because I have missed all the all the 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 changes that happened between the samples. I have missed those. I needed at least one more sample uh, here and here and here. I here here here. I needed a lot more samples to be able to keep track of the changes in the blue signal, which I didn't have. So I will not be able to reconstruct it. In other words, being able to reconstruct also depends on the frequency of the signal. And it depends on the frequency. That means I need to adjust my sampling time or the sampling frequency. If the frequency of the signal is high, I need to sample high. Right. If, if the changes in the signal are happening faster, I need to reduce the resolution in time domain. I need to increase my sampling rate in that case. And we, we are going to see what is the limitation on this? What is the lowest uh, sampling rate you can have? Because if you go higher, fine, you will get more and more samples, right? You will get here, 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 here. If you go higher, you, you, you don't have a problem. You will be able to reconstruct it pretty well. Although now you have more samples than you need. So again, you are going back to processing more and storing more. That's the problem. However, with the, there is a lower limit to this. And that lower limit is called Nyquist rate, Nyquist criteria. So we are going to derive that in just a minute. All right. So those are the ideas that we are focused on in today's lecture. Let's move on and take a look at this. Can X of T be represented uniquely uniquely, right, keyword, uniquely by a sequence of equally spaced samples. And those samples are, let's see, x of 0, uh, x of 0 here. This is x of t here, x of 2t there, and so on. Can it be represented uniquely? Well, the answer is no unless we sample faster, right? Fast enough, it should be fast enough, such so that fast enough meaning we should increase the sampling frequency omega s so that we get all the fast changing aspects of the signal. So if we don't sample it fast enough, if we sample very slow, for example, one is here, the other is here, what are we going to reconstruct? We are going to reconstruct that. Right. We are going to lose that, that curvature at the top. So we should sample fast enough to get all the fast changing aspects of the signal. If we don't, then we will not be able to represent it using, using that. Right. Also, because it is related to the frequency in the signal, we need to make X of T band limited. What does band limited mean? Band limited essentially means that after a certain frequency, omega m, there is no other frequency in the signal. It is limited in terms of its bandwidth, in terms of its spectrum. What is an what is, what is a uh, maybe an example of a band limited signal? Uh, let's see if I can draw uh, a, a a signal like this. Is that band limited? Based on the way I have sketched this, do you guys think that that is band limited? Yes is right. Because now in terms of omega, in terms of frequency, it is at base band, it is centered around zero but there is a limitation on the bandwidth it occupies. Maybe the lowest is negative omega sub m, the pos two positive omega sub m. Omega m standing for representing the maximum radian frequency in the signal. So if I say that humans use 200 hertz to four kilohertz, what is omega m in that case? What is the, what would be the highest frequency for voice? That's for voice. 
Ah uh ah, -uh, Omega M. All right, thank you. Right? So that would set up my uh, sampling rate, Omega S. Uh, uh, that would relate so to Omega S. Once I find the maximum frequency in the signal that I am trying to sample, that will dictate at what rate I should sample it, the signal. Because I know the maximum frequency, I can use that information. Um, some examples of a band limited signal, voice. It is band limited to four kilohertz, which means that in terms of radians per second, omega m, it is band limited to eight pi kilo radians per second. Telephone sounds, th those are all band limited signal. Uh, a rectangle in frequency domain, is band limited. A, a triangle in frequency domain is band limited. Is a sync band limited? No is right. Sync goes on forever. So it is not band limited in frequency, right? Because I said sync of omega. If I said sync of T, that would be rectangle in frequency and that would have been band limited. All right, so we have to have our signal band limited so that we can pick out the maximum frequency of that signal and then we can choose the appropriate sampling rate for it. Let's talk about ideal sampling now. Ideal sampling is also called impulse sampling, meaning take a continuous time signal X of T here and multiply it with an impulse train. This is your impulse train. What is the time period of this impulse train? Well, cap T, right? So when you sketch out P of T, which is a summation of impulses present at uh, zero, T, two T, three T and so on, they will look like this, 0, 2, uh, 0, t, 2, 3, 3, t, and so on. Uh, I should also point out that weight of all these is 1, right? Weight of all those impulses is 1 because you have a 1 there. Now, what are we doing? Here is the crucial step. You multiply two signals in time domain, right? So in, in yellow, you have multiply signals in time domain. What does that mean in terms of frequency? Convolve, absolutely right. So, on the frequency side, I should say convolution. What should I convolve with what? The Fourier transforms of the two signals, right? What is the Fourier transform of X of T? Well, find it out using the Fourier transform, find out X of Omega and you would, you would know. What should I convolve this with? I should, P of omega is right. P of omega is right. But what is P of omega going to look like? What is the Fourier transform of an impulse train? The only signal the only signal whose Fourier transform is the same as the original signal is the impulse train. So the, this is also going to be an impulse train here. Another impulse train. We have to adjust its uh, time period and amplitude, but it is going to be another impulse train. So I hope you guys don't mind convolving something with impulse train. That is easy, right? That just means that it is going to become repetitive after that. So 
x of omega copies of x of omega will appear wherever that uh, impulse is present so in that that's the that's the whole topic the whole topic is based on 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 that that's the idea that's the main idea now uh, how are we representing the signals in time domain we are saying uh, the sampled signal x sub p of t is the product of x of t and p of t x of t is the the signal that we are trying to uh, sample the continuous time signal that is sketched some some arbitrary signal here we have to leave that as x of t because we don't know any other thing about it followed by p of t p of t is an impulse train that we are expressing using a summation sign n is going from negative infinity to infinity you have delta of t minus small n cap t where cap t is the time period of the impulse train sketched out like this p of t is sketched out over here so when you multiply these two things what are we doing well you simply evaluate x of t right you simply evaluate x of t at the times at which you have the impulse so you get x of nt using the properties of an impulse function you can write that out x of t multiplied by an impulse what does that become you need to evaluate x of t at that particular time where the impulse is valid so that means x of 1t 2t 3t everything so that gives you a summation of n equals negative infinity to infinity x of nt multiplied by delta of t minus nt which essentially looks like this on the right side so you have those values here x of 0 x of 1t 2t 3t 4t and so on you have multiplied with those impulses so you have those impulses there so impulses with those weights are being added up that's going to be your uh, x sub p of t right which looks very much like x of t now um, but one thing that we have not yet figured out is cap t right cap t is still a question mark here how do i choose cap t because if i choose cap t to be uh, very big then my impulses will be very wide apart which means i get this value and then that value and i will not i may not be able to uh, reconstruct things so i need to pick uh, cap t that sampling time or the resolution in time domain appropriately uh, I, and you know it is related to the sampling frequency right so i can say uh, omega s the sampling frequency is 2 pi divided by t which implies the sampling frequency in hertz is what 1 over cap t so i have to choose the sampling rate choose sampling rate appropriately so that you can reconstruct it and that appropriately will address that what is appropriate and not appropriate in just a minute now let's talk about things in the frequency domain because that's that's essentially what we are after we are after convolving things in frequency domain because that's the easier thing to do i don't want to spend time multiplying two things one is arbitrary so i don't know it so i'm how am i going to be able to analyze it it is much easier for me to analyze the signal in the frequency domain in this case so i'm going to use the time multiplication property to begin with the sampled signal x sub p of t is written as the product of x of t and p of t x of t is the arbitrary signal p of t is the impulse train this is ideal sampling or impulse sampling in the frequency domain x p x sub p of omega the fourier transform of the sampled signal using the time multiplication property can be written as 1 divided by 2 pi x of omega convolved with p of omega so to do this let us assume that x of omega is a band limited signal this is a triangle shape in the frequency domain that's my fourier transform of the the signal that i'm trying to sample x of t and i hope you agree 
what is x of t going to be? x of t is going to have a sink squared shape, right? Um, and it is going to be um, sink squared, yes. It is going to be sink squared because in, in frequency it's a triangle. And sink squared is also band unlimited, right? In, in sink squared, in time, it goes on forever. So the signals that go on forever in time domain tend to be band limited in the frequency domain. And it actually works the other way around as well. So if, if it is band limited in time, if it is limited in time, it is band unlimited in frequency. And those can be proved by using the Fourier transform and inverse Fourier transform definitions. Let's come back to this. So we are assuming that X of omega is some band limited signal. Uh, it is band limited to some maximum frequency omega sub m. I am trying to convolve this with an impulse train. P of omega is the Fourier transform. P of omega is the Fourier transform of P of t. And we know from the previous lecture that the Fourier transform of this, let me write that down over here is going to be 2 pi divided by cap t summation uh, k equals negative infinity to infinity delta of uh, let's see omega minus k omega naught right uh, where omega naught is 2 pi divided by t so let me put that in there as well So in this case, it is periodic with respect to, um, hold on, did I write that correctly? 2 pi divided by t, yes. Um, and I can, I can write this 2 pi divided by t factor as omega sub s, right? Because that's my sampling rate. I'm using that Fourier transform pair over here. So I've got an assumption on x of omega. I have the Fourier transform of p of omega, which is another impulse train. The weight of the impulses in the frequency domain are 2 pi divided by t. The k is going from negative infinity to infinity. So all those impulses are there. The impulses are present at k omega s. So 0 omega s, 1 omega s, 2 omega s, minus 1 omega s, minus 2 omega s, and so on. So every integer multiple of omega s is has an impulse there the 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 amplitude the weight i should also write the weight here the weight of each of these impulses is 2 pi divided by t which is also omega s right so i need to do what i need to convolve these two things I need to convolve x of omega with p of omega and I need to divide the uh, convolution result by 2 pi. And when I do that, you notice what happens. When you convolve the triangle with an impulse train, that triangle will appear at 0, at omega s, at 2 omega s, at minus omega s and so on. Right. So you will get this particular shape. And because you have multiplied it, you have, uh, you have that 1 over 2 pi factor let me highlight that in red here. With this factor there, you are going to get 1 over t remains over there. Now the question is, what are we after here? Why are we doing this analysis? We are doing this analysis because we are after a certain frequency range and we don't want that to overlap. I'm, I'm going to come to that in just a minute, Alan. So where is that triangle coming from? Well, the triangle is the Fourier transform of the signal itself. So it is band limited to omega m. So if I go down here, this point is going to be what? Omega m. And this is minus omega. I think I'm using capital M. Yes, capital M. And if this triangle appears at 0, 1 omega s, 2 omega s, 
and so on and it also appearing at negative 1 omega s and so on. In order for those triangles to be disjoint, not to overlap, when they overlap, we get corruption in the high frequency regions of the signal. Because when you start bringing this triangle over here, let's suppose the triangle was, uh, let's say over here. What happens? Well, in that case, the, the higher frequency regions of the signal got corrupted because of overlap. That is called aliasing. And we don't want that to happen. And if we don't want that to happen, all we have to make sure is omega m is smaller than omega s minus omega m. That's it. Right? All we have to make sure is those two things are disjoint. So I can write a statement about that as this omega m should be less than or equal. If it is equal, that is the limiting uh, frequency, right? That's the limiting thing. They are just touching each other in that case. Omega m less than or equal to omega s minus omega m. What does this imply? If you do not want aliasing to occur, then you need to sample at at least twice the maximum frequency of the signal. That is Nyquist criteria. That is the limiting sampling rate. If you do not want aliasing to occur, if you want to be able to reconstruct the signal correctly, then you need to sample the signal at at least twice the maximum frequency in the signal. What is the frequency that you uh, that uh, humans can hear? Humans can hear up to 20 kilohertz. Which is why the standard sampling rate, one of the sa standard sampling rates is what? 44.1 kilo samples per second. Right? That's one of the standards that is used in uh, CDs. 41 point 44.1 kilo samples per second also the size of this it has other things related as well but as you can see it is just over twice the maximum frequency that humans can hear there is a relationship there okay so that is uh, you know very the, the probably the most important result that we will be talking about today the fact that sampling rate needs to be twice the maximum frequency of the signal that we are sampling in order to be able to reconstruct it from the set of samples. Move on. So that's your Nyquist sampling criteria. The Nyquist sampling criteria is listed out over here. We have just seen where it comes from in the previous slide. The, 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 the whole idea is these two points need to touch each other or be disjoint. If they touch each other, then that's the limiting case. That's when omega s equals to omega m. That's called Nyquist rate sampling. But if omega s is greater than 2 omega m, then we are sampling, then we are over sampling. And if omega s is less than 2 omega m, then we are under sampling. And when we do under sampling, then we will not be able to reconstruct the signal with the set of samples that we have chosen. Now, let's go back to this. Ny Nyquist sampling criteria. Take a band limited signal, multiply it with an impulse strain, you get uh, X sub P of T, the sampled signal. Then you pass it through a reconstruction filter whose frequency response is indicated as cap H sub R of omega to get the reconstructed signal. And if X sub R equals X of then we have done everything correctly. Now let's take a look. X P of omega from the previous slide was bunch of triangles that appear at 0, omega s, 2, omega s and so on. That was X P of omega. Now if I choose this X H sub R, the frequency response of the reconstruction filter to be a rectangle, a low pass filter, an ideal low pass filter, 
with a cutoff frequency of omega sub c, what is going to happen? If we choose the cutoff frequency to be half of the sampling rate, which is that point right there, then we will be able to extract the baseband version of the signal between negative omega m and omega m. And on top of that, we have also taken care of the gain of the filter. As you can see here, if this was 1 over t, we have made this t such that the output comes out to be a 1, which is exactly matching the amplitude of the original signal that we sampled. So in order for, so that's your reconstructed filter, right? That's your reconstruction. And if you, if you match up all the things that we did, our reconstructed signal in frequency domain looks exactly like the original signal in frequency domain, which means that we have done things correctly. We have chosen the sampling rate correctly. We have reconstructed it correctly. So we cannot, we cannot choose a cutoff. Uh, so what should we not do? We should not choose a cutoff frequency for this low pass filter too high or too low. If we choose a cutoff frequency lower than this, lower than omega m, then we lose the signal itself. We can do that. If we choose omega c to be much higher than uh, omega s minus omega m, then we are getting all the other uh, triangles as well. We don't want that. That's out of band noise as far as I'm concerned. I don't want that. So I want this filter cutoff to be in this uh, guard band between the uh, baseband version and the first harmonic of the triangle. And if I choose the sampling frequency such that omega s is greater than 2 omega m, I don't see any aliasing over here, right? So I don't see any like signal like that. It, it's not, there's no corruption in the higher frequency regions. All right, questions so far? We have been talking about how to sample the signal using ideal sampling technique, the impulse train. The core concept here is multiplying two signals in the time domain uh, is equivalent to convolving in the frequency domain. And we are, we are trying to convolve is the Fourier transform of the signal that is being sampled with a impulse train in frequency. Thereby, you see those triangles getting periodic in the frequency domain. And all we have to make sure is we need to sample such that those two points, omega s minus omega m and omega m, those are disconnected triangles. If they are overlapping, then we get corruption called as the aliasing. Okay, let's uh, move on. So the Nyquist sampling criteria is omega s, omega sub s, sample the signal such that omega s is greater than 2 omega m. You can, you can also write this as uh, f s is greater than 2 f m, right? Because if you, if you uh, divide both sides by 2 pi, you get this. Sampling rate in hertz should be greater than twice the maximum frequency in hertz of the signal. Choose the sampling frequency to be greater than twice the highest frequency omega sub m in the signal. The limiting value is 2 omega m. So that's called Nyquist rate or Nyquist sampling rate, 2 omega m. If your rate is faster, so if you are doing fs greater than, much greater than 2 fm, then that is oversampling. What is the problem there? The problem there is, well, why, why do I need to store and process these extra samples, which may not be necessary uh, to reconstruct? Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, selecting more than I need. If fs is much less than 2fm, then I'm doing undersampling. And in this case, you will get alias, you will experience aliasing 
or you know corruption no I shouldn't say corruption I should say high frequency high frequencies of signal get corrupted and as you go even under sampling like if you if you go too low then it, it it goes from the high frequency corruption to even the low frequency regions as well because there will be more and more of those triangles overlapping okay now if i can write this statement fs is greater than 2 fm can i write another statement which is fs is what fs is 1 over ts right which is um Sampling time, we have been just using T, but it is TS. So sampling time or the resolution in frequency, uh, time, sorry, a resolution in time domain. That should be greater than two times one over TM, where TM stands for the time period, right? TM stands for the time period of highest frequency component. In other words, you can say, uh, if you uh, arrange this properly, I need to choose TS such that it is less than TM divided by 2, right? So in, in terms of time, sampling time, that is, that is also the Nyquist criteria. sampling time uh, well I can also write this right NTS so I'm talking about that TS there the the time at which you have uh, those impulses 1 TS 2 TS 3 TS and so on in the previous uh, slide we have been using cap T all right so with this, let's move on to the next slide. Over here, we are going to talk about the phase of when we sample. So does it matter when we select those samples? Um, and the answer, and the short answer is yes, it matters a lot when you choose those samples. So if you, if you take a look at this, um, if you sample exactly at the Nyquist rate, the limiting case, you, if you sample exactly at what is barely required, which is twice the maximum frequency in the signal, that implies this. We have just derived this, right? We just derived this on the previous slide. The sampling time should be less than Tm divided by 2, where Tm stands for the time period corresponding to the highest frequency in the signal. In other words, you can say, I will be able to recover the signal if we have two samples per period. If you have two samples per period, you are fine. You will be, you will be able to uh, reconstruct the signal. So if you have three samples per period, good. Four, beautiful. Everything is good. But the limiting value is two samples per period. I need to have two samples per period to be, to be able to... Uh, uh, reconstruct the signal properly and depending on which kind of reconstruction I go for I might have some error or a uh, lot of error now let's see there is a limiting case of two samples per period the question that we are asking here is does it matter where those two samples in one period are chosen so for to 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 answer that we are uh, looking at a simple sinusoidal signal it's a cosine omega sub mt this one only has one frequency um, and we are sampling that at twice the maximum frequency this guy only has one frequency omega m so we are sampling it at nyquist rate 2 omega m uh, so our ts sampling time is exactly equal to tm divided by 2 and as you can see here, TS, the resolution in time, is half TM. 
half of the time period of the cosine. So if I sketch out the cosine this way, I'm just sketching out just over one time period of the cosine here. And we are multiplying it with an impulse train that those impulses are happening at two omega m, which means in time, they appear at uh, every, they appear every tm divided by two. So they could be, they could be here and here, they could be here and here, they could be anywhere, right? Two samples per period. Now, what if you chose those two samples to be exactly matching up the zero crossings of the signal? What happens then? Will you be able to reconstruct the signal with these two samples? Because right now what you have is that sample and that sample, right? Will you be able to reconstruct with this? No, it will all be zeros. Yes, what you will reconstruct is this. Zeros. No matter what you do, you do sync interpolation, you do staircase, no matter what kind of interpolation you use, no matter what kind of reconstruction technique you use, you will get zeros. Which means that the output signal matters a lot on where you take those samples, right? So suppose you took uh, those samples here, here and here. Would you be okay? I still have two samples per period and I've chosen those two samples to be there. Do you think that you will be able to reconstruct the signal with this? And of course, for the second period, they will be here and here and so on. Yes, I will be able to reconstruct with these samples because if I did linear interpolation, what do I have? You, I have this, right? Some error, but still I'm able to get some signal looking like a cosine. It's a triangle, but there is, so there is error, but it is recoverable. But if I went for sync interpolation, I would have gotten much smoother cosine. So if I choose those two samples, I'm fine. If I choose the other two samples, I don't get it. So it matters a lot where you choose your samples. That is the best case scenario. The zeros with the worst case scenario. The other option is also a little bit this way, right? Another option is to do it this way. So in this case, you will get, um, you know, a little bit of error, but it will look like a cosine. It will look sinusoidal, but with a sync interpolation technique, it will look sinusoidal, but there will be a clipping. So it will not go all the way to plus and plus one and minus one in this case. So of course there is a best case scenario and the worst case scenario is to sample at the zero crossings where you don't get anything at all. How about over here? Over here we have, how many samples per period do we have here? The same signal, uh, no, actually this is not the same signal. This is a sign. This is sign. Uh, how many samples per period do we have here? The samples are here, 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 here. So four samples per period. So based on Nyquist rate, we should be absolutely good, right? We should be, we should be in a very good shape to do the reconstruction because actually we are doing oversampling here. We have, we needed two samples per period. We are at four samples per period. So we are, we are oversampling by a factor of two here, which is very nice. So, well, which is not very nice, which is more than what is required. So we should be able to reconstruct. And if you did linear interpolation, what would you get? You would get uh, something like this. That would be linear interpolation. Um, and with sync interpolation, what would you get? You would get very close, right? With sync interpolation. Oh. 
you would get something like that, right? So you would get very, very, very close to the, the, the signal itself with sync interpolation. So we should be able to re reconstruct it. Um, to get those particular samples, what should be my impulse train? Uh, well, the impulse train should have impulses over here, for example. Those are the first four. So in this case, if this is say TM, that's my uh, T sub S, right? Um, and what is TM? That's TM is this. What is the uh, what is the uh, relationship between TS and TM? Based on the the signal chosen and based on uh, four samples per period, the sampling rate is four times omega m. Only one frequency here. Otherwise, we would have been talking about the highest frequency in the signal, which means that we have obeyed Nyquist criteria. We are sampling at greater than two times the maximum frequency. Omega S equals four time Omega M implies T S is one fourth of T M. And we can see that play out over here, right? We, if you compare these two, you know it, it, that's the case. And it obeys uh, the timing requirement also. T S is less than half T M. So they are both related. These two statements are the same statements. They are both Nyquist criteria. One is in frequency, one is in time. Uh, but this is an example where you can reconstruct things and here we are oversampling uh, by a factor of two, right? Oversampling it by two. And we should be able to get it, get, get it recovered. Next, let us take a look at this. Here, our signal is being undersampled clearly because we have less than one sample, uh, less than two samples on average per period. So we have one sample here, one sample there, one sample here, one sample there. We, we don't have two samples per period. We have less than two samples per period on an average. Uh, the exact relationship is the sampling frequency is four thirds of the maximum frequency of the signal. Uh, in other words, if you take a look at it in terms of its time statement, TS, where is TS? TS is right here. is three-fourths of TM. TM is right here. So TS is uh, three-fourths of TM. We needed that to be less than half TM. So it's not less than half TM, which means we are doing undersampling. And because of that, we will not be able to reconstruct the sinusoidal signal. Uh, in fact, if you try to recover it, it would look something like this, right? With uh, with maybe uh, a first order, first order filter, first order hold, what would you get? You would get something like this. Uh, there, that's first order hold. Right? Definitely not um, the sinusoid we were after. In fact, we have, if, if we have reduced the frequency that we were after. You can clearly see that there is aliasing. So when I say that we lose the high frequency region of the signal, you can see what happened here. It was repeating faster. We have, we, 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 we did not get that information. So our reconstructed signal is slower than what it had to be. So that is uh, based on a first order hold. Or, or linear interpolation, connect the dots. Here we have um, TS as five fourths of TM. So actually our sampling time is more than TM, oh, which means that we are undersampling by a lot, right? So this is undersampled again and this is this is going to fail here because TS is not less than half TM um, and our reconstructed signal 
using first order is going to look something like this. We have even if we have lost more information about the signal here. Uh, how many samples do we have on average? We have less than we only have one one sample per period here, right? On average, we have one sample per period. Uh, those samples are one here in that cycle and one here in that cycle and one here in that cycle. So we, with only those three samples in the, those uh, periods, we will not be able to reconstruct the signal, not nowhere close. Now let us come to the topic of uh, ideal reconstruction. Ideal reconstruction is uh, in low pass filter, but low pass filter means, um, well, let me ask you guys that. If I pass a signal through this ideal low pass filter, H sub R of omega, so it's a rectangle in the frequency domain. What is it in time domain? So what is, uh, my, my question is, uh, H sub R of T, what shape does this have? Well, if it's a rectangle in frequency, it has to be a sync function in the time domain. So it has to be a sync function here. The details of the sync function are written over here as well. Uh, so let me take a bold line here and say that and that are Fourier transform pairs. Right. So if you take the inverse Fourier transform of the rectangle, you would get H of T, the impulse response of the ideal low pass filter. So let me write that statement here. H of T is impulse response of ideal low pass filter, right? It's a low pass filter in the frequency domain. Um, I have adjusted the height here to T such that I get, uh, I, I have no change in amplitude on the signal being sampled. We have talked about that earlier. And I also choose the cutoff frequency omega sub C such that it is uh, equal to omega s divided by 2, right? So pick omega c equal to omega s divided by 2. We saw that earlier as well. I want to pick out the 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 ba uh, baseband version of the signal. I, I want to reject all the uh, copies of the triangle present at 1 omega s, 2 omega s, and so on. So if I pick omega c to be omega s divided by 2 and substitute that omega c over here, my h of t, the impulse response of this filter for that particular omega c is simply sync omega sub c t. So in order for me to reconstruct, I'm going to pass this sampled signal. This is my sampled signal, right? I'm going to pass this sampled signal which is represented by a summation of impulses with the weights of those impulses corresponding to the uh, values of x being sampled. If I pass that through this reconstruction filter, which is a ideal reconstruction because it's convolving with a sink here or sink interpolation, we called it sink interpolation. What would happen? You would get x sub r would now be x sub p convolved with a sync function convolution in convolution with a sync function here you have a delta here you have a sync so those deltas will get convolved with sync and you get h of t minus nts which means sync at those times you guys see that so xp of t those are simply these right and you are convolving that with impulse, uh, not impulse, sync, that's H of T. What would happen? This particular sync function 
will appear here, appear here, appear here, appear here and so on. That is being expressed as a summation at the bottom of the slide. X sub R of T, the reconstructed version of the signal is a summation for all n, X of n T, because yes, you have to multiply them from before actually. The deltas when convolved with sinks became sink omega sub C T minus N T. Take the first sample, multiply, multiply it with a sink at that time. Take the second sample, multiply it with a sink at that time. Third sample, sink at that time. Fourth sample, sink at that time. Add them all together to get the reconstructed signal. How does it look like? It looks like this. Where are the samples? This is say the first sample, second sample, third sample, fourth sample, fifth sample, highlighted in yellow. I have multiplied those samples with the sync function. You can see the height of the sync getting adjusted with sync functions. One is in red line, blue, violet and green and so on. Those are the sinks uh, expressed as sync omega s t divided by 2. Sync shifted and another sync shifted and so on. Also note that those sinks will cross zeros wherever the sample is present so that there is no interference between the reconstruction of one sample to the other, right? The contribution of, of one sink to the other is zero. They are orthogonal with each other. The, the sinks only contribute to the sample at which they are present. And then when you add everything up, you get that smooth aspect of real signals because you are adding up a bunch of sign, uh, sync functions, right? So in, in terms of a picture, we, we are showing the reconstruction over here. Samples present at negative t, 0, t, 2t, 3t and so on with those scales, those weights of those impulses, x of negative t, x, x of 0, x of t, x of 2t and so on. Multiply them with sync functions located at those times, add the results up to get the reconstructed signal. Ideal reconstruction also called as sync interpolation. That will give you a very very good quality of reconstruction. In general, uh, well at least in terms of uh, the three we have seen, this should give you the best performance. All right, let's move on here. Let's take a look at the zero order hold. Zero order hold filter, The what should be the impulse response? The impulse response of the sync function, uh, sorry, impulse response of the low pass filter, the ideal filter was a sync function. So what shape should this have what shape should zero order filter have and to answer this we will go back to this discussion here so take a look at this and please try to comment about the shape of the impulse response of the zero order hold filter what should it look like the impulse response of the zero order hold filter green <laughs> okay, yes, but shape, shape uh, U of T, well, if, if it was U of T, then the this particular sample would have added off with that. So th that would have become, you see what would have happened because of that. If you chose U of T, you have that. And on top of that, you, have, you would have added that. On top of that, you would have added this. If this goes on forever, then you will have something that, that, only increases, only accumulates, right? So we cannot have G of T. Although you are in the right direction, we cannot have G, G, uh, U of T. Uh, impulse function constant, mm, no, no, no. So try to, try to think about this. What am I trying to do between those samples? I'm holding the value until I get the next sample. So G of T is absolutely right. That's the gate function, right? 
So I need to hold it until the next value. I was earlier superimposing things onto a sink. Now I need to hold it, hold it until the next value is obtained. So in, in terms of its impulse response, it should look like a rectangle starting at zero with a height of one going up to t because this is at zero that is one multiplied by the value of the sample right x of n t so that gets adjusted but at t so zero t you see that so that should be the impulse response of the zero order hold filter and if i take the fourier transform of that guy uh, that's a rect that's a, a rectangle shifted rectangle so I should be able to find the Fourier transform pretty quickly. I will need two things, right? One is the Fourier transform of a rectangle centered at zero and the uh, time shift property. If I use both of them together, I will be able to find out the Fourier transform of H sub O of T, which will be H sub capital H of sub O of Omega, which is another sink but now you have this phase term here because of the time shift, right? Because in order to find this, what will you do? You will start off with a rectangle like this between negative t over two to t over two, t over two, negative t over two. You will find the Fourier transform of that and then you will shift it right to get that right and that shift is by t over 2 which is giving you that additional uh, e to the negative j omega t over 2 term in the frequency domain but that's what it looks like that's the frequency response of the zero order hold filter a sync function in frequency so in time it's a rectangle in frequency it's a sync how would when you take this in uh, if you have the function if you have the frequency response of the filter you can obviously plot the magnitude and phase of uh, how do you create this in circuitry? It's a low pass filter with a sink shape. I need to hold the value until the next one, right? So you can use a switch until you get the next sample. Hold the switch to, to be the same value, right? Sample and hold it until the next value. Sample and hold it with the next value. So a simple switch will, will, will do it. So if I have the function h of h sub o of omega, I can sketch the magnitude of this uh, frequency response. I can also sketch the phase of the frequency response. But I'm more interested in finding out the magnitude of the frequency response because I want to take a note of the frequencies that are being accepted by this and being rejected by this. So. If you take a look at this, uh, the sync function, right? Because this is a sync. I have a sync function in the frequency domain. And because the argument is omega t divided by two, that's why I get zero crossings at omega s, omega sub s. We are also sketching the ideal low pass filter here from sync interpolation. So from sync interpolation, you have the ideal low pass filter with a cutoff frequency of omega s divided by two. So that will give us the three dB cutoff of the zero order hold filter, which is what? The intersection over here. Uh, let me highlight that in blue. H sub O of omega sub C is 0 0.63 six sixty that is the cutoff of the ideal uh, sorry not ideal the, that's the cutoff of the zero order hold filter the yellow the yellow regions are for the ideal right so that's for the sink interpolation those points are for the sink interpolation the last thing is first order hold what should be the first order hold or you know what we do you call it? we called it linear interpolation what should it be 
Should it be like this? Is that okay? Linearly connect the two points. So between the these different modes, all that changes is the reconstruction filter. Yes, you are right. All that changes is the reconstruction filter. We are assuming ideal uh, impulse sampling on all these techniques, but uh, the only difference is the reconstruction filter impulse response, uh, which means that the frequency response is also changing. Uh, P of t is still the same each time. Yes, P of t is still the same each time. X of t is also the same each time. The only thing that changes is the impulse response of the reconstruction filter. All right, so coming back to this question. For linear interpolation or first order hold, where we were simply connecting the dots linearly, is this a good depiction of what the what it should be the impulse response of the first order hole filter you think this is okay now try try to think about this what would happen if you had those samples Uh, maybe I need to move this a little bit on this side. Oh. If you did this, these are the set of samples. And if you applied H1 of T like this, what would happen? It can only increase and drop. Right? Will you be able to go down here? No. When you convolve this particular guy with the triangle, you will go up and drop. You will go up. So that is fine. Drop. And then you will go. So you, you, you see that is not going to give you a good reconstruction scheme. So we cannot have that. What we need to have is the ability to move down linearly as well as move up linearly. So we should get both sides. So the impulse response should look a little bit different. It should go, it should be able to go up and it should be able to go down. Ah. And the height over here will be one, this will be t, this will be zero, this will be negative t. So now, this region going down aspect of the triangle will help with linearly interpolating down and then the linear increase will help with wherever it increases. So we get both aspects so to connect linearly down or up. Now when you convolve things, they will work out. And we do the same thing again. We take the Fourier transform of this guy to get the sink squared shape. So triangle in the time domain gives us a sink squared shape in the frequency domain. Uh, it is even symmetry, so you don't get any phase term here like we did in the previous case take the sink squared function sketch the magnitude of the frequency response and then try to find the 3 db cutoff of the uh, first order hold filter in other words try to find the intersection of the ideal fre frequency response with the sink squared shape it will be 0.4053 t so what does that mean? That means that this filter, sink squared shape filter, has a tighter frequency uh, to compared to the zero order hole filter. Right. Now coming to the reconstruction and some some uh, some related oversampling and uh, undersampling, or not not just oversampling here. So suppose this is x of omega the Fourier transform of the signal that we are trying to sample. And then we apply an oversampling factor of one, which means that we are at Nyquist. If we sample the signal at twice the maximum frequency, the maximum frequency be being omega sub m, if we sample at Nyquist, these triangles will exactly touch each other because of 
being at the limiting value. So the Fourier transform of x sub uh, x of omega, uh, the Fourier transform of the sampled signal will be triangles that keep just touch each other. And to extract this, I would need a low pass filter or a zero order first order hole filter that has a cutoff of at least greater than omega m. At equal to omega m uh, will give us the best. But I would need a ideal low pass filter to extract that out. If suppose I did a oversampling by a factor of four, what would happen? Instead of the triangles touching each other, like in this case, my triangles would be very far out. And to be able to get this, I would have to accordingly adjust the cutoff of my filters, the reconstruction filters, so that the zero crossing happens at omega s. What is the problem here? The problem here is whatever noise, noise you might have in this region will get through to the other side. So out of band noise will get through with this sort of filter design. We don't want that. A better approach is to be just over the oversampling rate of one. So just over the Nyquist rate, so that instead of being that far out in frequency, the triangles are instead over here. Which means I can bring this cutoff to right there. Oh, come on, no. Pen, pink, okay, cut off to right there. So, you know, undersampling is going to result in losing the signal altogether, but oversampling can lead to uh, getting some out of band noise during the reconstruction time. Okay, so that completes the discussion on sampling. Let me take.